pretty accurate. Um, <laughs> I, I went to lots of lectures when I was an undergraduate and also at, at Harvard, and uh, it was interesting. I often didn't remember the projects that people talked about, but I, I did remember their stories. I remember, you know, particularly the uh, development of their careers and how their life changed <coughs> over the time. And so that's kind of the way I, I like to do this. You know, I, I mean, I guess there are themes in the work, and there's themes in the periods of time that I've been working, which really started. Um, I'm just going to give you some uh, some information uh, and some images and projects from the early days of starting the office and then what we're doing now and kind of draw up our extrapolations in between. But uh, when I left school, this was the uh, Harvard, I was the 83, and uh, uh, I went to work for Pete Walker almost by the way. And we were living in a time that had a fetish, I think, really, with a stylistic excess and different forms and natures. But everybody, we were, we were all making uh, forms, I guess, to you know, waiting, waiting for uh, enlightenment or applause or whatever it was. You know, there's there's different things that you know become I don't know almost like a opiate or a substitute for independent thought. Or Changed kind of almost by decade. And so, um, but I, that was very much my, you know, way of thinking when I, when I started working with Pete. And uh, his particular uh, work was influenced very much by minimal artists like uh, Carl Andre, David Judd, uh, Robert Irwin, people like that. And um, what was going on there was looking at various minimal structures or ways of organizing space coming out of art and then basically kind of deriving forms and system for uh, as ways of organizing landscapes in larger spaces. And so we were really of that project all, all during the 80s when I you know, was kind of growing up in the craft and, and uh, uh, learning how to talk and things like that. Uh, after a while it uh, began to shift, I would say, moving into the early 90s project changed and it seemed to be things were more suddenly about stepping back from uh, the I guess the most gratuitous aspects of form making that had kind of gone to too far and too much excess during, during the 80s. And we started doing lots of maps of everything and, and generating palimpsests and the big compilations of stuff which became kind of substitute objects for uh, uh, modifying or changing spaces and environments. And that also kind of led, led us into parametrics. And I got, uh, worked with uh, Alejandro Zeropolo on an interesting project down to Park where we were trying to make uh, write sort of write programs or, or generate uh, forms out of uh, data and various parameters were introduced into a, into a system. And I just remember when, when the stuff came out, it didn't look right. So what we decided, what had to be done apparently was to make it look like it was right. And so I don't know, that doesn't seem right either. And uh, we kind of went on from there, but you know, I think we still, uh, at this point, are uh, very much of, uh, influenced by the kind of the, the parametrics, and, you know, looking for something which will stand between and uh, um, kind of mediate between having to just take the thing on yourself and have, have an independent thought or independent feeling it will lead to something that engages perhaps more directly. That, that's a frustration that I, that I deal with all the time. I've never been a good person at joining things. So every, every time I start getting involved in something, then I start back that way, that way as both as good and as bad. So I think today, you know, our fetish is really uh, sustainability. It stands in the way of thinking about things. It stands in the way of having a story that connects with uh, what that really should be about. Stories are what kind of go back to the stories of people's lives, stories of projects, stories of places to find something that really connects us with everybody that, that we're working with or dealing with uh, in a larger society. So uh, I, I'm kind of, I've kind of got to that point with all this stuff. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. That's, that's my little wrap. But uh, this was a project with uh, that I was, I was working in Pete Walker's office, and I had 
my first chance to kind of break out the, uh, uh, some of the stripes and the grids and the, uh, the very codified way of putting this space. Uh, it was in Seattle, Washington, and it was a growing company, and they had bought a large racetrack, uh, which they wanted to build a very uh, cost-effective uh, campus at their headquarters. Put, put a lake in the middle, put three-story buildings around that, and service park into the, to the outside, fed by roads. And one of the problems that happened was that uh, uh, there, were, there were weapons to play in the center of the track. So uh, I got to inherit this project because it suddenly became about weapon mitigation softers, you know, soil-borne uh, systems and, and uh, so forth. So we, uh, I use this as a way to try to, try to engage the kind of things we were thinking about in the office with this natural medium. So it was, in, a, in typical of the times, there was a, you know, a big contrast uh, we were trying to do. One was a, a system of, of forestation across the site that responded to the fact that they always wanted to see down right here from any point, and an engineer could pretty well respond to the entire forest being you know, aligned using the same natural material, kind of like a serape, it's all around the mountain. And then in contrast, uh, a system of water and wetlands that is uh, extravagant and curved linear and forming a lot of components for stormwater that was pretty new actually at the time. So this was the basis of our work, was this, this, this clash, this conflict uh, of trees and water, of wood and gravel, things like that. And this was the outgrowth. This, this is very early, like the first year of the bill. This is one, one piece of it that generated kind of a strange, sort of impulsive landscape that could be in the movie. And uh, it had its own strength. And it had a nice set of materials, something I felt more comfortable with the bark and logs. And we were all getting obsessed with uh, the Twin Peaks at the time. And logs, so it was kind of a, kind of a, I had a nice cult feeling about it. And as it grew over time, these lines, began to become softer and overwhelmed really by uh, uh, things that are related more to the soil moisture and the, the unrelated to the forms that these are proposed on the site, whether they are rectilinear or whether they are curvilinear. I was walking around at this spot actually, and they were completely invaded by cattails, trees were migrating, cottonwood seeds going up everywhere, and it kind of dawned on me that it seemed like obvious that we were just designing the wrong thing. That, that, that stuff that we were thinking about didn't really create uh, this landscape or create space. It was the, the way that the soil and the moisture interacted. So the first step, you know, kind of stepping back further from the, uh, that way of thinking was to work with some students on a similar site uh, in nearby Bothell, Washington. And it was the, the, the program was for a community college co-located at the University of Washington. But they, and they got permission to build this big college up on the hillside if we would do uh, another large uh, floodplain forest mitigation. This big, we had a hayfield down below. And the uh, hayfield originally uh, had a form of a series of uh, canals that for, for bringing logs downstream to Lake Washington. And uh, over time, they, uh, as, as the, when the lake was, was lowered, it became a hayfield. Drain the site so that it could be cultivated for, for hay. So, in kind of generating the reverse of that, holding more water on the site and working with the flooding that happens there annually, almost five, six, seven times a year, uh, we came up with an idea of devising a series of interruptions or weirs, and that these would be perpendicular to the flow of the flood water across the site. And we would use the most kind of brutal means of, of logging and crude, heavy. Northwest inspired materials to create this, this new cultivation, which was really about uh, breaking it down into uh, pieces of, of landscape, rooms full of wetlands, uh, a little bit like farming, farming wetlands across the site, and using these weirs as ways of moving out across it with a uh, rerouted stream and the kind of sinuosity that's, that's really better to produce the amount of water and the soil. It's typical of farm in detail. But this is what you're, you're, we were trying to replace. Um, and this is how we were doing that with large uh, bundles of logs or small logs that would be embedded and intercept the silt that was moving across the site, creating a, a, a step topography where there's drier, higher land, and then a scouring down below with the wetter species, which would generate uh, hopefully something along those 
across the lines on the right hand side. Um, and so that, that, that created this, this fun model that we made out of uh, bushes and twigs and grasses and so forth and some work with the students. It was a great experience. But the, finally, you know, it, we went back to creating an object, I think, and kind of realized that uh, toward the end that um, did this, in a lot of ways said nothing about the, uh, the behavior over time and how that would how that'd be experienced. It was really, again, creating this stuff. So, I think at this point it seemed like a good, uh, good time to step back even further from our process of now. And uh, so I got, I got to go to Rome and I get to spend a year with my own, you know, thinking your own thoughts. And this has been preceded by a lot of uh, looking at what I call the vernacular minimalism. This is like uh, uh, container ports, farms, and uh, fly casting, engineered fly casting ponds, looking for. Uh, Basically, uh, what makes a site beyond the, the, the composition of forces at work? And uh, so I get to Rome, and pretty much everybody's project I find in Rome is about, in some form, about the accumulation of stuff, of culture, of silk, and material over a long period of time. Because we're not used to that. It's just that things are very shallow here. So every, it, it's, it's a great experience because you kind of learn more about the depth. Value of what you're presented in the process. This was the Basilica on the left of San Clemente, which is a great place to visit because you basically spiral down in time. And at the very bottom, there was a, uh, in this, what's currently a important uh, basilica in the city, at the bottom was a Mithraean spring, uh, which received pre Christian here. And as each level you move up, you essentially move through other periods of time, from the uh, early Christian period to medieval to each one is its own level. So you get a very graphic understanding, spatial understanding of going down in time. That really gave, gave me the idea for this project here, which was to create a map of the city going back uh, 3,000 years in a similar way. Uh, so what, what was, you know, it's just, it's just the, uh, really just kind of documenting the sorts of accumulation to see what would come out of that in terms of what we're reading. Um, so rather than a geological map, it's kind of urban Geology. We were mapping, I was mapping uh, large public buildings, rivers, uh, public plazas, marshes, uh, roads, and uh, it just takes kind of a cold slice every 200 years, uh, which was a great thing to do in, in an environment where everybody kind of, tends to be uh, kind of academically or obsessing over a certain period of time or a certain coin face. It, it, was, it was really a kind of strong impulse to Stretch that out into what the, what the organic life of the whole city had been. You can kind of see it there, a little easier here. This is a, uh, at the very bottom, it's about 1,000 south of the family of the city. The, the losing the marshes, the expansion of the imperial city and, uh, for about 400 years, and then its contraction uh, as it began to uh, shrink and, and retreat actually back to about seven uh, palazzos. Lots of, Similar to the seven hills in which the city started. Uh, and this is the city uh, at, at, its, at its current time, a massive explosion of uh, streets and, and urbanization. But um, it gave a sort of a, like I was saying in the beginning, you know, experience in looking a little deeper into where you are, 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 Kind of a strange response to this project here. We somehow got it with Anu uh, Mather and Dilla de Puma at the uh, University of Pennsylvania into this competition uh, for the British Appeals Landfill. And uh, they're both uh, geographers and landscape uh, interpreters. Uh, and together with what we actually wrote, we kind of decided early on that we can't just make a we should not make a map. Some other step taken first to generate the understanding, which could become a resource for, for a lot of money going forward. And especially given you know, 9 11 happened right in the middle of this competition, we were all kind of, uh, again, stepping back from the conventions of the master plan. Um, so we identified 
five uh, dynamics of the site, which I don't know if you're all five of them at this point, but one was dealing with zones, you know, looking at a highway and how things kind of aggregate onto that to create uh, uh, a uh, urban structure based on a highway moving through the site, and, and some of the tectonics that developed out of that, more of the kind of sharing and uh, action. And just the opposite of that is the, the dam as landscape and soil moisture begins to move up slopes and establishing uh, interruptions for water, uh, holding water on the landfill and then on the slope. So that was data that was kind of more uh, horizontal. So th those were just two. Anyway, so this was the master plan. And I guess what I liked about this was it, it, it was kind of a uh, strong-minded denial of saying we know what to do. The idea that you could, from this project, hopefully uh, start a seven or eight or twenty different projects based on the uh, different look at the site and where it's been, and then this model projecting certain dynamics in the future about 50 years, based on the same idea of kind of mapping, uh, mapping to modeling to projecting and design. And here's a here's a title uh, title uh, channel highway. But at the end of this. Uh, at the end of this week, we got to exhibit uh, that piece of Archer Lab in Orleans, and uh, people all thought it was beautiful and this is very, very interesting, but it's so abstract that you're going to do an installation to help people understand it a little better. So we had this uh, idea to do much more of a kind of gorilla art installation in our, in our courtyard based on rubbish, uh, but in this case, uh, sorting it out into Ziploc bags based on all the stuff that they disposed of with the force of staging the exhibit. So we got this geology of uh, stuff of peanuts and uh, wine bottles and cigarette butts and uh, people that love this or hated it. But, uh, that, was, that was one step, I guess, in looking for some materiality or some personality to, to this very abstract way of thinking of going it. And then going further, you know, about the same time, shortly after that, Small installation that Cash uh, was inspired by. And uh, at the time, Johnny Cash had just died, and my father had died in the same year, and I was kind of lumping them in my mind together, wanting to create a puzzle uh, and do something, something that, that sort of spoke of, uh, of uh, rural life and, and humble, humble lifestyles and, and uh, some of the provocation within that. So, uh, this took its 30, 30, foot, 30 square foot, uh, 30 by 30 space, and it's surrounded with a 7 foot high wall of hay bales. And then in the center was a space that was uh, filled with uh, recycled screen doors uh, attached to the grid. And at the center was a uh, compost heap and a bug zapper, and at the other end was, a, uh, was the bowl, which, uh, which was a refrigerator with a machine in the here. So this was. Uh, this was the realization of that, and uh, you know, if it's, if it's hay bales, they're temporary, but they're very powerful materials, very fluffy, sound absorbing, thick material. And these, the flapping of these uh, screen doors, each with a different you know, personality, and series of decals, and carvings, and objects attached to them, and the people that had them the doors, you were able to kind of appear and disappear from the end of this thing to uh, the, the, the recollection, I guess. Of Screen doors whacking there in the previous times, stuff we don't do anymore. That was the uh, that was the destination. This was the uh, black refrigerator with water for the guests and food for John's uh, afterlife. So I got a little schlocky, but anyway, it was uh, it led in this weird way to another proposal, which was uh, uh, still in this mode of trying to honestly kind of make something out of. So Michael had designed this this vast, you know, kind of mushroom-shaped museum, which opened the shade in his very hot in Fresno, California, to shade a plaza and a, and a pool underneath. And the only problem is they need they need to raise money. They need to raise about uh, seven five million dollars. And they had this building on the right already. It was the, the, the museum at the time. So we were asked to propose a, a 
in a temporary, uh, some temporary landscape. I think they had about hundred thousand dollars. Could we do a few things? You know, some trees and some vines or something would make, make the demolished site uh, more appealing in the meantime. So uh, this is what I mean by trying to make something out of nothing. Seem like well, you know, let's we don't have to accept that proposition. We put a waste of money. Let's, let's instead get rented and donated materials and make the most part we can for these busloads of teams that dropped off uh, several times a day and terrorized the world of the building. So we created a, uh, using scaffolds and uh, that, that mesh that is used to contain the scaffold and uh, weighted down and ballasted by shipping containers and then uh, more hay bales and uh, sunflowers planted in seed to create a temporary park for, for teenagers. And uh, it allows you to move across the site, get to upper levels. Uh, this was the cooling chamber with a, a cloud in the center, which would just kind of permeate through the, the mesh and down into the plaza. And uh, again, help you keep cooler and dry the uh, heat they have there. That's the, uh, and then there's a space created for, for an interim if you're building. And uh, so this didn't happen. And it didn't happen, you know, because uh, everybody who liked it and said, well, we can't do this because uh, people will be around when they take it down. So uh, that wouldn't be the first time that's happened. So uh, that was that. In fact, we, we got to go along with it. But uh, began to kind of get, get the sense of what, what the limits were. And, uh, what, it's all in the project of getting yourself out there, I suppose. And this, this is one's project. And we started off as some of the first five years when we did things like this. Initiating things, not waiting for it. So uh, it's, it's the best thing to do to, to get yourself known, to get started. Um, fortunately, right about then, I was approached by a uh, art collector in uh, Morgan Stone, San Francisco. And through Aaron Betsky, uh, I said, well, by promoting me to everybody, I mean, we got into this project without hardly any qualifications whatsoever. And what he had was a uh, 16 acre vineyard in the Valley, very nice place. Uh, and he had on the right is the, is the site, and there's a, there's a house, kind of a pseudo Victorian house with a kind of jungle stuff around it. He wanted to, uh, in fact, he had Tom Main uh, design a library, which was kind of a big parking structure up against the hillside you see there. And unfortunately, it came in at five million and one million, and one million, and that was the end of the project. So then he re recalibrated and decided that art was really this, this, this thing anyway. So he uh, commissioned uh, James Terrell, the uh, artist of the Resident Light Distortion, to, uh, put, uh, to put a uh, sky space in a swimming pool he would build, and where you would dive into water to enter. And then he would come and say, well, this has done some work, but it, not in uh, Orleans. Uh, but this one, you'd actually uh, swim underneath the water again, too. So we were brought on to work on that, uh, because Terrell didn't design the rules. And then we gradually grew it into some Larger and based on the organization of land, which is which is sort of our my my uh, inclination. So the project is organized in two halves. On the left side of that big red line is the house and its cottage garden and a great grove of redwood trees, very small. And on the right side of that line, which is a big stone path, is a much larger, larger scale, uh, minimalist composition uh, that can exist side by side in the house. Uh, and that was the idea. For Project was extending the lines to the horizon and using that as that, that split down the middle. And there's this huge grove of redwoods, and one idea was to let one of these trees just fall over on the side and establish a very kind of minimal line uh, in elevation as you approach. But on, you know, as you, as you move around it, it becomes much, much stronger and the major extrusion of it. Is. This was an early model uh, where we were trying to get part of this art gallery underneath the We also need to realize we need an architect to become an owner. The budget got much tighter. I mean, we ended up something more like this. And uh, Jim Jennings came in and said, just an architect, very you know, strong, severe, and this was the perfect person for this project. And he liked the scheme and he helped us design a pavilion. And really, between the, at the end, you see the, the cube, the grotto, and this lavender garden between. And 
Uh, to the left there is a box, that's a very tight little thing that contains the changing rooms, the kitchen, and the box storage. Basically we're at parties and then this sheet of paper is extended across the space, onto which Terrell did a second uh, light installation above the diners. And so this, this was the reason. We sort of moved a lot of stuff. They had their landscape reopened to them. So this was just how that was planted. Um, the pool, uh, as it begins to lift out of the ground, the land begins to tilt. And so at the far end, it's about seven feet out of the ground. It's one of these wet edge pools that it's about these days. But it was nice in a, in a vineyard to have that kind of uh, slick surface. It was very rough, uh, rotting grapes and leaves. And looking back at the uh, of course, the hillside of Jim's Pavilion, uh, and a nice uh, kind of buildup of uh, experience. And then uh, in the uh, pavilion, this, 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 this is the nature of this kind of eight by eight uh, pockets. It is uh, lit by uh, billboard LEDs coming out of the side. And you're not supposed to look at it at this time of day, you're not supposed to look at it at 3 3 or 4 at the twilight, but it's, uh, it still has its own. Uh, anyway, this, this, is, this is it when you're supposed to look at it. And, uh, it basically, uh, it was in the early days of LEDs, and so I think that it was a little, maybe a bit more of a disco sort of uh, Terrell that uh, was able to do all of this over a period of uh, three hours. It goes slowly, so it's not like it would make it dizzy, but uh, he was really exploring the, all the color combinations of the the Oculus and the, and the, the surface. And this is our drawing of the of swimming inside that uh, cube, and this was the, the actual reality of the whole space. And uh, this is being inside the grotto. And it's interesting, this, this really was not as exciting and not as nice as the one that was uh, extra, uh, the big sheet of paper. And it was because, you know, most of the trails work, you, know, you were always uh, adjusting yourself to get you know, strap into something, and go underneath something. All these things are before you swim underneath something, and then you get to have the experience that the pavilion actually, just going back, you know, uh, anybody can go there. And it's actually, it put this fantastic line of light onto all the uh, oak trees and the pebbles and all. It brought in the site in a way that I didn't quite expect it. And it was sort of a new sort of social channel. I don't know if he's still doing that kind of thing, but he, he, uh, he, he told us it was the third best project. Some of the materials they water, the gravel. Barbara keeps his pool very hot because it's steaming at all times of the year. And about two thirds of the way through the project, he'd been reading in the uh, uh, in Sunday paper that you could dig caves from 75 dollars a square foot, and maybe he could still have his art gallery after him. So, for about 48 hours of the project, he emerged to tunnel into the hillside. Two architects, three architects, uh, Martin Cox, and uh, I think the person named Martin was the one who did most of the work. Those who were, they, they left Stephen Paul for the one before, and they were, they were good, you know, shaped interior lighting services. So um, we worked with them to, to set up the entrance, and then they, they did all the interior gallery. And so what was nice about this is that you come out on the bottom right, this is you have a great shot, axial, you know, of course, heavily axial view toward the horizon. Earth to you know, skies. But the other thing we discovered is that uh, the place is called the Zillia Springs Vineyard, and uh, we managed to make the cave into the springs because it excavated such a large uh, portion of the hillside, it diverted and kind of sucked all the water into the caves. We had 50 gallons a minute, which now passes underneath, underneath the floor, which is very, very uh, ugly conditions so they can actually have a lot of park space inside there. But that was the, you know, it made a nice ensemble all together. And the other interesting thing about it is that uh, I had to justify the sustainability of the project. So what I explained was that, you know, other famous clients in the, in the neighborhood had spent, I don't know, 55 million dollars on the neighborhood to build a video bunker on top of which would go a uh, little glass building. They ran out of money. Since the moment. So, uh, this project cost about five or six million dollars. So, I, th I think that there's a, you know, in, in 
engaging with their own stuff, their own landscape, and relying on, on uh, more of a uh, exterior social condition, they, they got a good value for their, for their dollar. And that's a sustainable story I can relate to. Um, so this, this is a jumping way forward. And this is actually a project that we uh, we won with the Kennedy Village in uh, 2010. Uh, and this is for the Minneapolis Riverfront. It's about five miles extending from the city center where the Dutch's Country Theater uh, and mills are up to the northern border. And, it is, and this is one of the more appealing pictures of that environment there. It's basically a, uh, there's, there's my, my compadre Sheila, uh, her first visit. This is a piece of the Mississippi River and has a series of bridges spanning. There are a few parks up next to it, but basically uh, uh, we have a lot of this. And it is most that industry, the industry. Uh, the city would like to grow into this area. They'd like to have access to the river again. Um, and so a lot of this has to uh, work with and come in different ways. It works currently like an aquatic truck to all the barges and we're using this to load and unload material thing was on the trains, however, it's, it's heavily, it's very not profitable, and it would seem to be really an area to, to convert to something else. At the same time, uh, in Minneapolis, there, there, there's a terrific system of moving along the Mississippi River, connecting with lakes, uh, connecting through Minneapolis itself, and uh, that's basically uh, Minneapolis there, Right here, this is the missing link, which that zone was talking about. And it's part of the Mississippi Flyway that really connects uh, Mexico to Canada for birds. It's, it's really a lateral connection as well for a lot of species and for people at the same time. You can't ride a bike with them. You can't, can't make connections. So our job is to, to find a way to make it happen, working with their uh, all of their stuff. And we have spent a lot of time really learning their stuff. I think that's probably why one is dug very, very heavily into all the local initiative, contacted hundreds of people, interviews, not really, but uh, she, like, in a lot of ways, drove this very intense look at what was going on, and we all got into it. It became a sort of consortium, looking at many, many uh, individual initiatives related to creating contact with the river, uh, and beginning the process of reversing the smokestack industry. It was based, essentially, uh, on this idea of intersecting loops. We would use these bridges and the shorelines to create a series of rooms along the road where you could travel along the shoreline and connect across the bridge, which might be a rail bridge right now, and you're attaching a marsupial bridge or some other way to make it across the country. And so each, each section of the river could be built in the uh, could be a space unto itself that's about the river, and then could, could extend into the city as a group. And we worked with the, the dynamic one. It has two sides. One side of the car is intense to cut the land, and the opposite side, which tends to deposit, is a lot softer, siltier uh, material. And as, as the land uh, shifts, the dynamic reverses. It's weak. This is our, our reach right here. So we worked. This is, this is the cutting into, uh, into the heart bank and a series of ravines, which allow water to travel over a, over a, over a softer route and get down to any percentages. Creates a series of promontories next to them. And along the soft side, we, we uh, deposited a lot more material, working with that, shaping it into something that creates a much more uh, diverse and highly developed uh, profile of soil and water uh, working together. Uh, and we propose large wetlands cutting in on, on the soft side, like this, and they become uh, really a regional part that can support development of the next side of these variable tracks. And this is model of that regional park. This, this is probably like 25% of the whole site. But this is the barge port, and it's the most likely to become something else. And, uh, so this, we're right in, right, in, right in the throes of making this maybe really happen like this. And it's, it's based on principles of depositing uh, sediment they're using all the time. They're, they're constantly uh, digging sediment down the river, replacing it. So we're creating this uh, series of large uh, bins to store the sediment, build it up over time, create new, new topography, and also cutting other places to create more weapons where only rocks will to exist. So it's, it's a part that's of this nature. It's, it's more about movement and about people and movement of water and movement of uh, various
different species to make something that connects with sensibilities that really uh, account for a lot of them in the Atlas of the that are just the city. It's the we're experiencing. They made a, seri a series of uh, islands in the Hawaii, which are used to collect sediment over time and build these things up and over a period of 10 years and divorced it. These are the bluffs in the winter, you know, with the uh, ravines cutting in and then extending back out of the ground. That's uh, both the ravine and the all of them. This project here is what we're working on right now to hopefully get built in about two years. Uh, it's at one of the uh, first bridges that we work with to create a new pasture across the One didn't exist. This was a lumpy yard, which you know, the edge of the edge of the river was you know right out about the middle of the island. So we are cutting a big back channel and restoring an island which was a bit further into the river. Uh, and the project here is to create a more domesticated piece of water that allows people to get onto the water to really launch themselves onto the whole system. And to have that surrounded by a certain amount of uh, development of profit, park support, all the structures. And that, uh, the first thing, the most important thing to do is create this launch point. To work carefully with the, with the topography the water was through there, we're still doing various types of uh, sediment modeling to understand how that works. It's kind of a new, interesting you know, modeling that actually uh, generates uh, form that water is looking for. It's this kind of idea. Uh, this is the current state of the uh, topo. And a barge sitting pool there at the edge of the river. Um, at the same time, we're trying to generate opportunities for people uh, Quite a bit less fortunate. The North, North Minneapolis is a, is a huge uh, neighborhood that's really deprived and separated by this large highway. So, this was probably the most aggressive intervention that we proposed was a, a large landward on this six lane highway. And the new swath of river that creates opportunity for people to come and join and get their piece of pie at the table and connect it with an existing park in the highest in the highest in Minneapolis. It's a new sort of it's the prospect of this neighborhood uh, in the city. And uh, like Bob mentioned, we, uh, we did win this competition with uh, Michael in uh, St. Petersburg. This was, that was in January. And uh, did, he, did he present anything or did he show you? Yeah, okay. Look at it, Yeah. Well, this is what it, this was the problem here. Uh, there were three teams. There was Big, and then there was West A, and there was uh, Michael B. This pier was built in the 70s, it's a converted pyramid, which uh, was typical of the times. Uh, it's got this full of uh, chalky shops and uh, kind of recent, recent school cafes and things, and then all this parking in front of all of them. And the problem is that in this marine environment, the structure is corroding uh, down below, and it's got to be replaced. And it costs more money to rebuild this than to just make something new. So this led the idea of this competition to replace what has been for them structure is something that could, maybe could also solve some of the problems with uh, how the city operates. The other problem with having all this building down on the water is that just the basics of this part to lease and sort of operate and uh, it's very very limited to space. Uh, so we were kind of both of the same mind that it would be great to come up with an idea where number one, you don't need to go out and come back you know, the same way just to see this kind of thing. And so this, I was drawing things like this of the, what they call the upland, the, the land-based portion, and Michael's drawing things like this, of the pier itself going into the water with the idea that there could be some kind of figure eight experience. You go out and back it up the way, you expose the water timber, and then you might actually embrace a piece of the water itself, uh, which is where the naval lens can be able to the water, because in the sky, uh, and then actually be light in the water as well. So this was a scheme that emerged from and uh, it's a system that kind of re uh, asserts itself way back up to create a big set of green and have to some of the marinas. And, but as its uh, signature uh, flagship, you know, this is a piece which, which uh, is traveled out, circle around a piece of water which has both a small boat marina and, and a new reef uh, that's, that's created uh, in 12 meter water. And that's the, uh, I think this was probably the, the, uh, the convincing graphic. And, you know, it's a good idea. It lets people get
get up high and this stay low. Uh, you can go different ways to be able to recycle it. But the big thing here is all that uh, retail is put onto a uh, village on, on shore. And it's just centered around it's a place called the hub, and it can start very slowly, a few thousand square feet. Uh, it's very adaptable, it's easy to service. It's not, it doesn't need to be fantastically beautiful to work. It can be much more of a neutral structure leading to uh, this uh, grand glory out of the water. And it's also a very flat environment. You know, you, there's, a, there's a space between zero and kind of six feet that uh, is uh, anything that violates that gets people concerned. You know, it's, it's a very strong figural importance of this. So in this case, we, we work with very subtle uh, topographic variations from about plus six to minus three to create a lot more diversity of, of, of vegetation and relationship to water uh, so that this experience is, is, has both uh, vertical and horizontal diversity that allows uh, endless, endlessly different loops to, to take place. And again, to avoid you know, the everywhere, everywhere you can, trying to break out those two uh, samenesses across the main buildings here. And also the, the, the crossing, I mean, it's clearly clear you're not going to be able to look back exactly the same way you do now. So that's going to be a good time. This, this is the small boat we made with a big canopy over the top, and you mount up onto that big sort of like, eggshell structure and just serves balconies uh, that you can kind of penetrate through to the other side. That's the reef inside. And there's a, the piles of the old uh, pier are there. So we are working trying to preserve these piles and then basically sling uh, reef modules, artificial reef modules, between to grow uh, seagrass, oysters, things that will clean the water, uh, which is very silty by nature, and to create a localized area of clearer water where all the, all the other species that attend that service and create a kind of an intensification of the natural environment that we're attending today, together with uh, various technologies about, about imaging and sensing and uh, audio phones and other water environment. But it's based on uh, basically oysters on the one hand and seagrass on the other things which let the area in between uh, develop and multiply. And uh, you got a lot of trouble for this. It looks so nice, you know, but it looks like the floor of keys, right? And it's not, it's, it's, Tampa Bay is not the floor of keys. So we've been learning a lot more about how to deal with uh, siltier water and what well, that's going to really going to look like, how much it can be clean, and how to do imaging. And so uh, I'm going to a meeting on Wednesday and we'll be uh, uh, trying to avoid the press as much as possible. The protests are outside. It's, you know, it's this conservative community and this structure is really out there. I think, thankfully, the structure of this, this is the whole lightning of the project, and so uh, I'm happy to help. Uh, this is the last project that I'll show you. This is the one that uh, Bob Mitchell which recently got the Urban Man Institute. And uh, it is a uh, Birmingham, Alabama. It is not on the way of release anywhere, but uh, it is trying to rebuild. It, it was in the, uh, in the 60s, it was a civil rights battleground. They lost their steel industry. Uh, they had a lot of uh, white flight in the suburbs. So we have a very segregated, in, in terms of habitation, situation in Birmingham, where mostly African American and uh, Hispanic families live inside this railway facility. And most of the white families live in the suburbs. However, there was a lot of planning done by a guy named uh, Bill Gilchrist, uh, who brought me to town the day after I met him in the mayor's institute. They had this opportunity for a park in the middle, in the middle of the most uh, vacant section of downtown, and uh, he was going to run an international competition and so on. And, uh, that's the worst idea that occurred when we just bring us in the fire. So, he did a lot of talking and through all that stuff, that's, that's really what really happened. And the idea was to, the, the, the downtown of all the banks and the, and the uh, drivers of the economy on the north side versus downtown to the south, just off the University of Alabama, lots of 
major huge hospital biotech research expanding dramatically in the world toward, toward the same area. So the end of the park was creating a living room or a central amenity that would bridge the gap between those two over and engage this rail viaduct that was through the center of the city. The rail used to serve two steel furnaces, one on the far end, which is still on a store site, and one on the far end, which was dismantled. So this is the uh, uh, overview of the whole park, uh, which shows you the connections offside and the uh, relationship to downtown. Uh, all these warehouses you see uh, to, to the lower, uh, lower right are being transformed fairly rapidly, actually, into a lot of conversions. And then there's a uh, minor league baseball park that's getting built right here. So what's doing its job is urban but it's actually a complete, and this is, this is the way it looked at uh, the beginning. So we had a few buildings, it's full of uh, various strange things in the soil, all that had to be worked with. And we really engaged the topography, both for reasons of uh, restructuring the space economically and as a way of controlling and developing a water system, which could become a way of irrigating the site and uh, creating Drainage system and flood protection. This is the lowest area in the city. So we, we worked a lot with Topo, the way where to concentrate water, where to excavate, where to where flow. Um, also places to house their, their big parties. They have fantastic uh, parties from 20,000 people uh, called the Crawfish Boil, where they're uh, hearing bands for two days and drinking beer and eating one uh, of the crawfish, two smaller things. There are 3,000 people in music all the time. Movies. It's, it's great. It's a great. Uh, Social city, and so those spaces are formed in Topo, and then mounting up and surrounding them are landforms which allow people to see up over the city and the park. So that was the basic move was to excavate the blue areas and fill the red areas in this park. That's the realization of really taking all the material on the left and pushing it to the right. Um, it also engaged this uh, urban grid in a way that was. It's basically practical. This street you see here is really the biggest uh, connection to the university's hospital and the children's hospital. And so there's an urban initiative to make this uh, the main drag in our town and this plaza to receive people and become the, the, the uh, launching point for other things to do in the park, a place to uh, have some facilities and some food and some shade. And then a series of other uh, entry points on each one of those city, uh, city streets, which then brings you across the boardwalks out to Rail trail. The rail trail runs along the top of all these hills. And the idea here was that uh, there is no river, there's no bay, there's no natural element to uh, around this people point. Really, the city was built around these rails. They didn't want to effectively get a river. They liked the trains. This is not a project where trains are going away and disappearing or being marginalized or overcome. Uh, they want to experience them just the way they are. They go out every weekend and they're train spotting. Or an amazing graffiti art that passes back for 11 tracks. It's just like this, uh, three or four different types of motion in different directions. It gives one a sense of river. So we decided that this really ought to be a train front park. And so your, your train front is on this rail trail, which moves, starts down here, rises up, crosses over, and brings you a series of ridges that connect all the way along here to have a direct experience of trains. So that's sort of Meetings wearing uniforms and bringing spikes and things. Like that. Let's just let them have a direct experience of the thing itself. And you know, people seem to really dig this. And the Toko allows the reading of the trains to be, uh, to kind of be some feel, feels like it's moving through the park itself. This is the rail trail bridge, uh, which is also the top of the water systems generation is dropping on the lake. And then this series of boardwalk connections from the streets which bring you over to the trail. This is the plaza where uh, things happen, and it's, it's really, uh, I worried it was under-designed, it was too, 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 uh, too open, but it really works well for there. They have huge events like this, and so it wasn't too, it wasn't too uh, unarticulated. Uh, we worked with a lot of uh, humble materials. There was 
difficult to use concrete here because the ground is very unstable. The foundry sands and the soft stuff. So we used a gabion, which is favorite material of mine, uh, because you can put stuff in it and it comes out of the site. So this is limestone. There's also bricks and cobbles and sweet curves that need to be used uh, to create the sort of structures that uh, would normally have been in uh, stone or concrete or stone and steel. It's a series of items that it's like. More of those walls and the stream which drains the lake. And it's effectively the main playground. Bar, which uh, runs with cold water and what have you. Using the cobbles that came out of the, the street. Plaza. Carving into the, into the topography to build uh, more of the Greek theater foundation of the playground. Uh, there's a major promenade that runs the length of this, and it was necessary both for the huge utility reasons, but it was also really useful for uh, keeping a connection available from everything to the, to the west, all the way down to the uh, steel furnace at the far end, which is the other uh, big tourist uh, experience in town. So we proposed to connect them. And we didn't you know that their first projects were part of the project, so what we proposed instead was a uh, fairly expensive tractor pull, which would make a bit of a covered wagon, Ice cream and cold drinks and the lower demand from the swamp, swamp, swamp land. And it would, uh, it would travel. Yeah, it, would, it would travel back and forth this, this route all day long and uh, be, you know, be open to uh, collaboration with some local well developed and developers there, uh, especially in this last place. More shape of the Tomo, this leads to the VIP seats for the garbage world and the cell phone for me. They show movies there in the 3000 BC amphitheater, the same shape lawn. Uh, and the other thing that happened here was that we were able to create a ground for their downtown that existed before. And there hadn't been any, you know, good way to see it. And by creating ladder services uh, with the rail, the foreground, and the downtown beyond, uh, it began to add up into a symbol for them that felt very uh, transforming and meaningful and created really you know, a new offering. So this was a, there was a steam plant down at the far end, which would be converted as a city project to take that. And the parking lot next to it and create a new uh, cultural next to the So we were able, it was, it was built, uh, we were having kind of able to and needed to use the borrowed scenery of the city uh, to draw the, those, all those things together. And that's the end of the show. organized to the way that the 
the, uh, the stones were arranged and the bricks and the, the gabions. And I, just, I just kind of love these sort of silk stockings that allow, that, that are not overwhelming the, the place. I'm always looking for also things that all people already have, you know, uh, that they don't need to build. That's always my line. You don't have this, you need to build it. So they're, they're so happy they want to pay for something. But it's, it's really more than that. Because so in my business, you go around to places and, uh, you know, we live in a big store culture. So people want to be able to others. Can we have a Millennium Park? Can we have a uh, this or that? You know, high line. So, well, you could. You could put a big, you know, Paris for this. It's, it's a very kind of uh, gratifying, encouraging process to work in kind of a social way, uh, drawing out these things uh, of their city and of their kind of uh, personalities and their, their social structures that you can allow to kind of become players in the process. So it's a little bit the same thing, but at a very simple scale. If there's one thing that I feel like has uh, kind of persisted and developed, would be that, I don't know, I'm not sure how to look That and there's uh, always been, I think I tend to really want to uh, take the simplest, simplest uh, geometry, you know, I, I, I spent a long, long time with Jim Walker and I, what I, what I love is, I love kind of build up lines, I guess, too, I love gestural things and like clear, very, very simple, uh, kind of gross level connections, armatures that are able to work with that, you know, I seem to always be trying to create one larger armature which can have a lot of ramifications but has the most simple understanding, the best way of orienting people, uh, understanding the story of their, their own place through something which may have very abstract form but it's made of their stuff.
proposing back and forth. Working with Michael, you know, is more, uh, he's definitely the architect. And uh, we had, you know, we had a very uh, close uh, idea of what should happen uh, at the beginning. We're now working on our, more on our separate scopes, and it's a big project that's going to move quickly. And, um, it kind of ran, you know, ranges in there from one to the other. But, uh, I have to say, I, I've enjoyed experiences where we uh, brought the architect in. Uh, those are the places where I, I got the most, uh, I think we got the most of what we were trying to do. Prano and Sheila came in on that one uh, and helped with master planning on structures and later local architects came in. Uh, and we were able to maintain continuity for like four different layers over six layers of time. One of them was in jail for six to counts of fraud and money laundering. We still got it done. And I, one of the great things, experiences over that was the most that they could agree on. Contains some of that, and, 
I find, you know, I find that are, there are good devices to work with coming out of, uh, you know, the Walmart and things like that. And those are the pieces I guess I picked up were uh, things of nature. What I did like so much was uh, the more uh, um, directly kind of replicating or uh, kind of drawing, trying to make it suggest something else. I hate the landscapes that are trying to make you think something in particular. This is a hard I, uh, I don't like I don't like things that are trying to represent usually something else. I suppose that breakout project would be the, the closest to that. But it was very material. Yeah. It was just the, the sound. You know, I, I forgot to mention the uh, yeah, there was this recording that permeated through the uh, through the screen doors of uh, distorted fragments of pulsing that was used in the fire. I guess. So, I, but I love that kind of stuff moving through those kind of screen door. Grids, wafty compost, and then snapping the bugs. It's sort of not so far away. Back into what it once been, 
regenerate myself. But that, but that's that's a story I can understand a lot better than uh, slow water management or imperatives. And 